Hello, everyone. Hey. Welcome back to Pacecast. We uh, took a, a bit of a break last week, but uh, we're back now for an 11th episode. So, uh, hi, guys. Uh, nice of you to be watching. And this is Pacecast, our uh, live podcast all about drifting, RC drifting, every Tuesday night at 7 UK and 8 U uh, Central European time. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is Thijs. Um, I'm from Enjoy RC, another channel you can find on YouTube. And then uh, on the other side of the screen is James from oh, Marcy Boss and, of course, this channel, Pace. Um, so, yeah, we have a couple things for you tonight. Uh, main topic for today will be dampers. So we'll be going over some of the basics of uh, assembling, building, uh, setting up, fine-tuning dampers. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, feel free to join in. Uh, we'll go over the basics, but if you uh, want any more details or anything specific, uh, yeah, just uh, give us a shout and uh, we'll try to explain it for you. Um, with that, we uh, have the live chat going as always. So any other questions, comments, uh, yeah, just send them our way. Um, and then, uh, of course, as always, we have a couple extra extra things we're going to be talking about, like the news. Um, I have some new stuff that I'm going to show you. So yeah, that's uh, that's our program for today. Let's, uh, let's kick it off with the news, I would say. Yeah, well, I guess we start with um, a very quick one. But uh, Acumans have made a, a, the tiniest of updates to the fledge motor. Um, they basically now changed the default timing from 20 degrees to 35 degrees. Um, and it's actually something they've been recommending to me to try since maybe January, I think, something like that. Um, and basically, because of the change in sound from the motor, people in Japan are running this with a lot more timing just to make it sound more angry and make it sound more like an agile, more like an overdose motor. And so um, the the extra power is a good thing, but there, yeah, so the stock setting is basically changing from 20 to 35 degrees. Um, so basically they recommend that anyone who's already running a fledge should try it out, uh, try turning it up. Obviously don't just crank it up and leave your settings on crazy power on the ESC. <laughs> uh, make sure you back it off a little bit on the ESC, turn it up and then then find a happy place to not have too much temperature, too much, uh, too, or drain your battery too much. Um, but yeah, it's definitely worth trying. It's something I did earlier this year and I liked it. I, I dropped it back down a bit, but I was already running pretty angry settings on the ESC to get it, uh, to get the feeling I wanted anyway. So uh, if you're already doing that, it's not something you, you really need to do, but it's quite a lot, 35. So yeah. yeah, it is. <laughs> um, but I think it's, um, it's not a high talk rotor or anything like that. It's, it's higher than than a standard one but it's not there the, with the high torque rotor and these are pretty powerful motors in general and pretty strong motors so i think it's it's just about a feeling um and i think it basically because you can also change the the torque curve on these using the jarvis xx um it means that you can you can really sort of dial it in and get the get the traction point where you want it and just in set it up to to suit you as much as anything and i think that they realize is especially when they come to or uh, well, when they came to Holland every year to the Worlds, the guys at Acuvance realized that people didn't really play around with stuff like this too much in, in Europe. Most people would literally buy a motor, plug it in, and not change any settings on it. Um, so this is essentially Acuvance giving, ev giving everyone a nudge to say, like, you know, try it. See if you like a bit more timing. Um, in, in general, over here in the UK, at least, people tend to turn the timing down rather than up. Um, so, yeah, maybe just give it a go if you've got one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I never played around with it much, but I, I did do it a couple of times and it makes quite a big difference, actually. Um, yeah. Some motors feel really, really slow. And then if you turn up the, the timing a little bit, it completely transforms it. So, yeah, it's yeah. I think it's a, um, a lot to do with the initial acceleration on, on some motors. So um, I actually counterintuitively find that running more timing on low grip surfaces can sometimes gives you better traction at slow speed because you actually have a bit of... Um, a bit more uh, response from the motor so you can control the, the traction point a bit better but yeah like i say just a it's a tiny little little update from them um, but it's good to see that they're making the change and and also advising people to try it out um, these there's no difference in the motors whatsoever they're exactly as, the same as they were before except for when they're assembled they're set to 35 instead of 20 um, the, there's nothing there's no different bearings or shims or anything like that it's just all all exactly the same um, so yeah, like looking at the picture, you could go even further than 35 IC. So yes. quite a big range, actually. Yeah, it is. Um, and actually, just uh, I'll take this point to remind you that Acuvans generally with their motors and ESCs recommend a maximum of 60 degrees timing combined between uh, motor, ESC, um, 
and, uh, and uh, sorry, motor, turbo, and boost. That's how I meant to put that. Um, and I, it generally, you don't need 60 degrees. Uh, personally, I've run more than 60 degrees with no problems. But essentially, they say if you keep every, if you keep the combination under 60, you should have no problems as long as you're not absolutely wailing on it or bouncing off the rev limiter all the time and things like that. Um, and as I say, I've I've never had an issue, um, not caused but from anything like that anyway. Just keep an eye on the temperature. <laughs> yep, always keep an eye on the temperature. And if also if something feels wrong or sounds wrong, just check on it. Make sure there's no dirt in there. You know, you can see on the, from this picture that the side of these cases are pretty open these days to allow for better cooling. But that also means things like uh, body clips and staples that might be on a track or dirt can get in quite easily. <laughs> and anything that gets wedged uh, against the rotor can cause damage. It can also cause resistance, which means the motor pulls more power to make or to get to the same speed. So you kind of have to just keep an eye on stuff and check it. And also, if you have access to an airline, blow out your motor after every session, especially at a track. You'll be surprised what comes out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the other thing that we've got that's new this week, it's a new body from, uh, yeah. well, I wouldn't say R31, but I actually should say Shibata. Um, since they, they that, changed their name. Is that the name now, yeah? For, yes. Uh, for the yeah. RC stuff? I saw it on well, the Well, it's for all their stuff. Well. It's all their stuff now. They basically changed because um, R31 House doesn't really cover... Th these aren't R31s. So when mm. it was R31 House and R31 World and R31 Kingdom and all the different names they used, that was only mm -hmm. R31 parts and shapes, and that's the reason they only did R31 bodies. Um, and now that they've changed to Shibata, they can make other things that aren't just for R31s. So they're doing a lot of stuff with the new Jimny. Um, they're making Jimny bodies. Uh, obviously, there's this, uh, uh, what is it, a Q60? Yeah, Q60. Q60. Yeah. Um, but it's a, an Infinity car that I don't think we get in the UK, um, or we got in the UK. Um, I might be wrong because Infinity was here for a little while, but they uh, they disappeared pretty quickly and... I say that I think they disappeared. They could still be around, but they um, <laughs> they don't sell many cars. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, and same, so same here. It's I think the only time I've ever seen one. these has actually been in Japan as taxis. There's one one spot in uh, Tokyo where there was a, about fifty of these as taxis, which was a really <laughs> weird taxi. Um, and I'm sure it was probably a four door version of the same car, but it was this shape for sure. But uh, yeah, this is a it's an interesting one anyway because it's as far as I know, nobody else makes a body um, of this particular. No. Uh, shape uh, it's available end of april um and it's pretty wide as you can see it's uh 203 mil at the front and 200 at the rear so it's certainly not a narrow body um, and yeah, they're going with the the modern style having the front slightly wider than the rear yeah so this will definitely accommodate most most current setups anyway yeah for sure um but it, it looks kind of cool i think uh, it's it's not really my cup of tea but I think it's it's uh, it's good to see somebody doing something different um and they do say that it's got uh front and rear bumpers with the grill are separate and it's uh polycarbonate light buckets included so that's kind of the the standard you'd expect these days i think from most uh most of the smaller body manufacturers exactly yeah and i think they're also campaigning uh a q60 now in formula drift japan okay uh or at least that was the plan for 2020 i don't yeah. know if any events are going to happen but um, I think that's why they also came out with this body shell. So I wouldn't be surprised if at some point they will have the livery available for it as well. Yeah. So maybe they, they did, a, I think, a limited run of the R31 yep. with the livery. So maybe that's something to look forward to. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, I, and it wouldn't surprise me if the other one came out and was slightly wider as well, um, because they, mm. they did the range with the R31s. I think it was last year when they, when, when they were launched and they had, I think, three different widths available. Um, certainly two different widths and um, even though that from a distance they look kind of the same body so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be too surprising to see something different but I think this will look pretty cool running low um, and I suspect that it'll be well it's 6900 yen um, so it's not the cheapest body but it's not super expensive um, and it's got super yes. short overhangs as you can see so it's a, a bit of a GT86 uh, 370Z um, the Lexus RCF yeah. a few other ones i think it's in pretty much the same range i suspect maybe a rear motor might be a bit tricky with this um <laughs> and possibly high motor but probably not i think it's probably as long as it's uh like a 
um, an RMX type high motor position, it's probably going to be fine. But yeah, it's definitely needs to be run low. That's for sure with those over fenders and that front lip. <laughs> I think actually the body kit is quite subtle. I think the did they, they might have did they have another body kit for I don't know. I I saw some pictures of maybe that was the real car. Uh, it has these crazy these crazy fins and stuff on them as well. Yeah, they they did launch this with pictures of the real car, which I probably should have grabbed one as well, but uh, <laughs> I didn't think about that. But yeah, so well, that's kind of all... that's the the fresh stuff for this week. Um, yeah. Again, there's not too much because of what's going on in the world right now, but uh, it's kind of good I'm to surprised. see. I'm surprised. I mean. So far, pretty much every week we've had a new body shell. It's uh, we're we're really spoiled spoiled for choice uh, at the moment. Yeah, so. yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, but you've had some new stuff come in, which is kind of yes. cool. Yeah, yeah, we've been talking about it for a while. Um, but indeed, the high traction wheels from Topline or Integra by Topline. Uh, so these are the Advan T sevens, I think. Um, and uh, this is the high traction in fluorescent yellow. So I'm happy with that because it will match my uh, my team body shell. Yeah. And I'm uh, I'm very curious to give these a try. I now have the MST ones and the these from Topline, so I can uh, maybe do a comparison test at some point if uh, tracks open again. They do look but, pretty uh, damn cool, I have to say. They look really good. The color actually matches really well with my yeah. airbrush. That's a that's a bonus. So, yeah, I'm curious to give this a try if the happy tracks open again. Yeah, I think uh, I tried. So these are the V3s, aren't they? I uh, know they're the Integra version. So yeah, I think these yeah. are the same as the V3s. I think uh, I get very confused because uh, <laughs> Topline and Integra and some of the other smaller brands that they use, they release the same part, but with slightly different names. Um, and from my understanding, which is just my guess, I might be might be very wrong on this. Uh, things start out as Topline, and when they're a little bit older, they get they can be changed to Integra. Um, and I think my understanding is that the molds are the same. Maybe the colors change and things like that, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so they had the the top line version, which again they may not have done this design. I might be making this up, but I think I I think I saw these as a top line V three, um, maybe last year or the year before. Um, yeah, they could very well be wrong. They've had this design for a while from top yeah. line indeed, and then this is the the new compound plastic basically they've used. Yeah. Um, as far as I've seen it, I think the Integra stuff is the more competitive oriented stuff. Um, See, so I, I need traction wheels and so on. Initially, I thought that, but then I saw some of the more budget stuff goes Integra mm. as well. So, mm. yeah, because they also have Outlet and a few other ones. Outlet is usually indeed the old stuff. And yeah. Um, so cheap. it's it's a, a little confusing. And when I've been to competitions in Japan, I've seen Integra <laughs> drivers as well as top line drivers. So, um, oh, that's it's uh, it's so weird. Yeah. I don't know why. And it's, it's the same guys. The all they take the same team photos, so they're all together. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it is a little bit confusing, but I probably just need somebody to explain it to me that understands it properly, because so far I've had to sort of guess and work it out for myself. Um, <laughs> but Integra stuff's always good. It's essentially, like I say, it's top line, and for the most part, top line parts have been good. Um, I've had one thing I've I would recommend never buying from top line is their uh, uh, ball end reamers. Uh, mine broke in the first three seconds of trying to use it; literally snapped in half. I got it. I got that one as well. So yeah. I'm going to see if it will survive. I haven't taken yeah. it out of the package yet. Um, and uh, if you're ordering pinions from Topline, you should be aware they do aluminium pinions as well, um, mm. which are not always the best to use. So um, you need to make sure that you're buying the right one because they also do hardened steel ones. They just have lightweight pinions that are aluminium and very soft. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, you also had something else turn up uh, at long last, which I'm assuming came in the same package. <laughs> ah, yes. Yes, it did. Um, so these are the, the top line masking tapes and, uh, I mean, the, the top line thing is just a tag on it. Uh, it is three M tape, uh, which I found seven years ago when I was in Japan in one of the DIY stores pretty cheaply. And I bought a whole stack of it and I've been painting my bodies or masking my bodies with it ever since. And it, it has been the best tape I've tried so far. So, um, if you ever want to give this a try, they're actually quite cheap. I think they're like a third of the price of Tamiya. Uh, half the price of some of the other ones. Yeah, uh, yeah. Give these a go. I uh, highly recommend them. Doesn't they, matter which tag they have on it, as long as it's the uh, the same three M tape. Yeah, they also have the aluminium tape, which is pretty handy to grab because that's a lot cheaper than the Tamiya stuff as well. Yeah. Um, there are lots of people that do that very cheap, but if you're ordering masking tape, chances are that shop will also sell the other stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of cool. 
Um, yeah, it's funny, these these 3M uh, tapes, they're a Japan-only product. I tried to get boxes of them here, and it's just not really possible. No. It's really strange. But uh, yeah, it's great. Give it a try. Uh, and then to use the masking tape, we have a, yeah. we have a new project for you. Yeah, yeah. I thought it might be cool to uh, to share the progress on this new project every week on the podcast uh, with some tips and tricks of the stages I've been going through. Um, so what I'm building, and we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, is the new body shell from Taniguchi, uh, Atsushi Taniguchi. He, uh, I think he released this together with Tachujin, uh, and it's his uh, crown body shell from uh, Hyperdrive. Uh, so the typical uh, Japanese police car styling, uh, as you can see here in the picture. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been starting with the build. Um, I, I'm at the point where I'm masking everything now. So hopefully next uh, next week I have some paint on it so we can go through that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's quite a project. We have some good progress pictures anyway so far. Um, so one of the things we've got is the packaging. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. That's obviously used this, essentially the same photo that we've just used as well. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of cool because Taniguchi is one of those guys that he's, uh, as we mentioned before, he's incredibly well respected. And he built this as a drift car quite a few years ago i think and he sort of used it a bit and done demos and exhibitions with it and i have a feeling he ran this car i might be wrong but i have a feeling he ran this car before it was uh, liveried like a police car um but uh it's super cool to see that they've they've brought out the body um because did you order this through tatsujin or did you get this direct i did yeah 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 i, I was I... stuck in japan for uh, for two weeks because they're having issues now with shipping so i think i might be one of the few people who actually have it uh, now because all the other ones, they're probably stuck somewhere in Japan in some depot of uh, whatever shipping company, and then the rest might not get shipped out yet. So, um, yeah. Well, I guess uh, we should start with your progress photos. Um... Yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm, I'm at the stage of masking everything. Um, so first I, I cut out the body shell and then uh, masking everything. And I thought I'd share a few of the tips and tricks I use while uh, cutting the body shell and, and masking a body shell. So this, uh, this first thing that I wanted to show is that I'm using two different CD markers because those actually work on the on the Lexan body shells and on the film that's on it. Because most pens or markers are something you can just wipe off straight away or they don't go on at all. Well, they're uh, too CD thick. CD markers. Yeah, exactly. But CD markers, they're, they're perfect for this. And you can easily wipe it off if you do something wrong. But I usually just trace all of the cut lines on the body shell with a CD marker. And the reason I'm showing the, the two different ones, uh, the one on the bottom is the normal one, just your standard CD marker, which is great. But the other one is a very thin one, um, which I use for when the cut line is not really there. Uh, some body shells have it. I mean, uh, to me as an ABC, I think are always the best ones with very deep, uh, deep lines that you can easily trace with your knife or your scissors or whatever. Uh, but other, other body shells, Pandora's, Tatujin, be like this one, um, sometimes they have parts where the line is just barely visible, uh, and then having a thin line actually works really well because then you can just trace that thin line with your knife and uh, be super precise. So that's uh, that's one of the the one of the tricks I wanted to share. So like this. Uh, yeah, Sorry, I, I forgot that we had a picture demonstrating that one. Yeah, yeah. So basically, everywhere the lines were very visible except for on the over fenders. Um, so that's where you can see I use a thin line to trace it um, and then follow that with a knife. So I just, I always use the, the cut and, or the score and break uh, method where yeah. you just, uh, you don't cut all the way through, you just, you just score it with a knife and then you can sort of slowly break it apart and it, it comes off in a super nice cut line. And I'm assuming yeah. very importantly that you're using a fresh blade every time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So always go for a fresh blade. Um, and the reason I put this picture in is because I wanted to show the knife that I use, because a lot of people use the, the scalpels. I have one here somewhere. Um, oh yeah, here, uh, a scalpel like this one, which is, uh, which is like a super thin and super precise blade, but to make big long cuts, I find it, it always wanders a bit too much mm. or it's too sharp. It goes all the way through the Lexan too quick. So I use this really big one um, because it gives you a lot more control. Um, so yeah. That's one of one of the things I use um, actually, um, I've just happened to have one tan is I use uh, single edge razor blades, mm. um, 
and that yeah. that to me uh, i find if i have a scalpel or something with a long handle i struggle for accuracy with it um so i find yeah. that the closer i am to the blade the the straighter an edge i can get um and also the better control i've got with pressure um, yeah but yeah, I, th it, that's a, I think that's i think that's a yeah. that's one of those things where it's just a personal preference thing and there's definitely no oh, right definitely. way of doing it i also use the scissors every now and then yeah. for example on side skirts where you have to have a, a really nice straight cut uh, to do that with a blade is difficult but if you have a really uh, a pair of scissors with really big uh, big blades on it it's super easy to make one long straight yeah. cut um, um just while we're on this topic i actually picked up these uh curved scissors um which i don't know if that's going to focus these are super cheap in japan i haven't been out they i know they've got to be readily available by some manufacturer in mm -hmm. europe um these are like three euros in tam tam um and i pick up a set every time i go because they're super sharp super accurate um they've got no play in them and um they basically are so much better than the tamiya ones but they've got a slightly bigger radius on as well which is a lot better yeah. for if you if you want to do any wheel arches or anything like that um or just uh you know doing the, the edges of lips and uh splitters and things like that it's so much easier with them so if anyone has any idea where you can find the slightly bigger ones than the the, the tamiya um, or the core <laughs> rc or any of the other brands um they're there's something i need to know about because currently i have to go to japan to buy them <laughs> but yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I, I always use a mix of both uh straight straight scissors curved scissors big small blades yeah uh, but as you can see uh, this body shell was also a bit of a puzzle but this is all the accessories basically um so the body comes with the bull bar or the push bar uh light buckets it comes with the the boomerang please light on the top uh even the even the wind deflectors for the sides or the side windows uh, a grill the police logos or the crown logo a bunch of different things ah oh, that's I what they are find... i was trying to see what the the, the things yeah. at the bottom were yeah one is like a dome dome light police light and yeah. then the other two are either a crown or the police star uh, emblem you can put in the front grill uh, i did find that it it comes with round police spotlights for in the bumper but if you look at the picture of the actual car it has square lights um so this this is one of the things that I'm I'm going to be doing. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, good spot. It has a square LED light. So I I downloaded pretty much every picture I could find of this car. Took some screen grabs from uh, from Hyperdrive on Netflix, and I'll be trying to make this as screen accurate as possible. So sticker placement exactly as it is in the in the series. Um, all the little details I'll try to add, like uh, uh, the bonnet pins and and emblems and logos and whatnot uh the correct lights maybe a 3d printed push bar um so yeah i'm gonna try to make this uh as screen accurate as possible well speaking of which you had some yep. work to do yeah so that's uh that's one of the other things i wanted to do um i want to paint all the logos so if you uh if you know vivian from src um he did a video tutorial a while ago on how to paint logos on your body shell using your vinyl cutter so you can cut out logos in uh, in, in mirrored um, and then stick them on the inside and just paint over them you can use this vinyl stickers as a masking um, which is something i've been doing for a while as well but usually not for the logos but for flames and tribals and stuff for delivery and now i'm gonna do it with this one so i basically scanned the sticker sheet find out or found out that uh, some of the fonts were not correct so the, the big number on the roof, for example, it's a different font on the sticker sheet than it was on the real car. Uh, it was missing one kanji character on the on the boot lid. So I've, uh, I've been playing around with it a little bit. But uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm using my vinyl cutter for it. It's super easy. Just some yeah. random color that I don't really want anyway. And one that stands out. Like this one's purple. So there's nothing purple on the car. So you can easily spot any bit that you missed for example yeah um and then yeah all the text is mirrored so i'll be sticking it on on the inside and then painting over it and then peeling it off of the body shell again and uh if you don't wait too long the stickers come off just fine without any residue yeah so, i yeah, actually um, i did some testing with that with the uh with the vinyl that i've got which i forget the name of it's oracle something or other um but it's uh i tested it for three weeks and it had no problem it just came off without yeah. any residue um i did a test I, I basically printed out a load of letters put it on a, a bit of lexan and stuck it on and then uh each week i'd peel off one letter and see see how it worked so i was quite quite pleased with that because 
if you want to do complicated designs that are going to take some time or you, you know you get busy you need to be able to leave something without ruining the project um, and having to rush it yeah, yeah so in, in this case i actually have like a positive uh, mask so I'm, I'm masking off the letters what i'll be doing on the other side is actually do the is the opposite where i'm putting a, a stencil basically on it and then paint the letters first and then peel off the masking and do the rest around it okay um, that's that's just to have the, the order of painting in a more logical way yeah. so i don't have to clean my airbrush every five minutes back and forth between white and black or something so, yeah yeah that's uh that's where i'm currently at so hopefully next week uh, it will have some paint and then we can uh, continue from there so which which order are you painting i'm gonna do the black first on the bottom so i'm i'm sort of masking off the top um so that's where i'll be stenciling the letters as well because they have to be white uh and yeah and then at some point i also do all of the chrome trims and the the window trims uh all the lights are masked uh, and like i said i i took so many screen grabs to make sure that every bit of the the painting and the stickers and everything will be correct um yeah it's a it's a bit of a challenge but it, it will be fun uh the I, most most important question for me is is it going to have flashing lights i'm not sure yet maybe i think you have At to man. I, yeah the problem is those like the light bar to get that working correctly with the the flashing lights is difficult uh, abc makes them but they burn out so quick oh really uh yeah, I have one on my other car as well, and it, it lasts for a month and then it's dead. Oh wow! Um, okay. So uh, so yeah, I'll I'll see what I can do, but uh, it's a uh, it's a minor detail. It needs to look right on the shelf. Yeah. So how uh, how far do you expect to be by next week? Like, what's the next step? Uh, I hope I have some paint on it. That's yeah. uh, that's the next step, and maybe in the meantime, I'll be uh, playing around with the 3D designs for the bull bar and the the square um, police lights in the front few other bits and pieces i'll try to do the roll cage as well which is very um you cannot really see it in this picture but in the uh, side windows you can see all the gussets really really well because uh, the cage is super far back in the car yeah so i'll uh, i'll try to mimic that as well because it's it stands out so much as a detail i think it would be nice to add yeah so, yeah definitely man and it should be cool because i don't think there's gonna be too many of these around um i think they're gonna be quite a, quite a special thing but, uh, only it's only going to really hit with a few guys. I think that are desperate to order one from Japan, um, or at well, least it, at least paint it like this. Because I'm yeah. I'm keen to get the body, but I'd want to paint it as just a cool street car, not a not a police car. Yeah, yeah, you easily can because it comes with the normal crown uh, crown emblems and stuff too. Nothing on the body shell itself is has anything to do with the police version, so yeah. you can easily make this. Into and it doesn't have car. dimples for for light mounting or anything like that, so that's good. Nothing, no. Yeah, I think it'll Which be a very a... cool street car, a uh, street drift car. Um, Definitely. And I, I'm a big fan of crowns, I have to say. <laughs> but yeah, I guess yeah. Uh, I guess we should maybe move on to our, our main topic for the week. Yes, let's talk about dampers. Yeah, so we don't have uh, don't have too many images this week. This is going to be more of a sort of discussion, I think. Um, one of the things we basically want to cover before we get to the more advanced things is the basics of how dampers work and um, how they're assembled and not so much uh not so much any of the advanced build tips or setup uh tips for advanced drivers it's more just a uh, a breakdown of of what goes or, or what a damper is and what it does really i think um so yeah we yeah, stole this uh picture from one of the overdose manuals because i think it's a good <laughs> good uh a, a good illustration that will help us to identify things yeah with the exploded view so we can go over uh, each of the components to give you uh what, what for us at least is the most used name for that part yeah if you have any questions or anything you know what to ask for and not say oh this round plastic thingy at the bottom but you can yeah. actually call it what it is yeah um maybe also explain a little bit about what it does um without going into too much detail unless you want more detail then feel free to ask in the chat. yeah i mean if, if you've got any questions feel free to ask um the plan is that we'll do follow-up uh, discussions getting into a bit more detail and a bit more advanced stuff later on um but the one thing we didn't want to assume is that everyone watching knows uh the basic stuff because there's nothing worse than having people talk about something that you want to want to uh utilize and and do for yourself but without understanding the stage before um so yeah, so essentially the 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 role of the damper is to uh, work with the spring to 
control the car, control its movements, uh, control its weight transfer, um, and to provide stability in corners um, because obviously the inertia of turning a corner makes the car want to roll. Um, and the uh, the choice of damper settings and damper positions uh, basically will counteract that. Um, they're a hugely personal thing. So um, there is a massive variety in uh, damper speeds and resistance and spring choices and things like that. Um, that actually mean that you can run the same dampers as somebody else, but with a couple of very small tweaks, they will operate completely differently and your car will feel like a completely different car, um, which is a great thing because it means that you can really tailor the car to work for you. But it's also a bit of a negative when you're first starting out because you can have a very small uh, mistake or a very small uh, reliability problem um, that can ruin the experience and the fun of, of drifting because... Um, you basically need your dampers to work evenly, uh, at least per axle. So your your two front dampers need to be identical as much as possible. If one damper is going slightly faster than the other, then your car won't be stable. Um, it will pitch down to a corner uh, when you're braking, rather than uh, you know if you brake, the front should just come down. But if one one corner is a bit slow, then it will pitch to one side, which will just make it feel horrible and mean probably mean that you can turn one way better than the other way, uh, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I guess we we should probably start with the basics. Um, the so this is kind of a standard damper design, um, not just for drifting, but for buggies and pretty much every discipline that's out there. Most of the dampers are built essentially this way. There are differences in terms of uh, cylinder lengths and um, obviously with that the the length of the shafts and piston sizes and diameters and things. So you can't really mix and match. You can't really mix and match between brands when it comes to components. There are some exceptions to that. Um, but if you've got overdose dampers or MST dampers or Yokome dampers, you should probably buy parts from that manufacturer first, um, especially when you're starting out, because there are there are times when you can put parts on from a different manufacturer, and there are manufacturers that make parts for other brands' uh, dampers, but it can be a bit of a minefield. And if you get the wrong part, it probably won't work. Um, or if it does work, it probably won't work as well as the proper part and there's not really a cost saving to be had with with standard damper parts um some of the parts are fractionally more expensive but until you get to things like the overdose hg dampers um they're roughly the same price anyway um but uh yeah and the, the tolerances on things like dampers are are pretty tight so it might seem like something from another brand will fit mm. but it might not perform as it should and and with things like the o-rings they might fit initially but then if you're using yeah. the incorrect oil you can have problems with swelling and then you know not long later you suddenly develop a problem which takes you a while to identify because your dampers did work fine so you forget to check them uh, but anyway so i guess we should probably just start with the with the basic assembly um so mm. you've got the the damper cylinder um which in this picture is obviously od 1536 um it's the and middle part, the biggest part of the damper. Yeah, basically. it's it's the part that everything is assembled into. Um, it's essentially where you start, um, and the uh, the role of that is to contain everything. It sounds really stupid and basic to to say that, um, but people forget that the um, the pressures with dampers can actually be reasonably significant, and it's quite important that the dampers are tightened sufficiently when you assemble them. Um, not too much. You, you, you do need to be careful with over-tightening. Um, but you also need to remember that, the, as Taj says, the tolerances are very tight. So you shouldn't use things like pliers when you're assembling these. Um, I've seen many people that have... Uh, if I just grab a damper, it's probably easier just to, to show you. Um, I've seen many people use pliers to hold them which i now can't find so these are some random pliers but they'll grip the threads like this and wind things on and actually what you're what you can do is you can warp the the cylinder and so instead of being perfectly round it's no longer round and the piston binds at a certain point um which is obviously no good um but one of the tips i would generally give people when it comes to putting these together is to remember that everything needs to be lubed um uh, or or many of the parts need to be lubed. I should probably clarify that to say. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things you can do is just put a bit of shock oil on the threads on the outside of the um, cylinder if you're struggling when you're when you're assembling it, um, because 
some of the cheaper brands of dampers um, the threads aren't cut that well or they sometimes have a bit of debris in so you should also inspect that um, or inspect for that um, I've had it before with a couple of dampers where there was there were uh, the threads were perfect apart from one turn and they wouldn't assemble properly because essentially they hadn't been cut um, but yeah so the as you can see here you basically have the shaft that goes through the middle of the cylinder um, with the piston attached at the end um, and then in the bottom of the cylinder you've got uh, OD 1169 and 1172 which is the uh, o-ring and then the uh, guide that the uh, damper shaft slides through um, when you're choosing o-rings you have to as we say you have to use something from that manufacturer um, until you know better because um, they are often very similar between brands but they're sometimes look the same but are actually very differently sized um, or differently shaped so the overdose ones are uh, x rings so they basically have a groove cut in them and you can fit other ones in them um, but if you get the wrong option your damp is not going to work very well um, and then essentially the as you see there the assembly can go together um, and the order you do this kind of kind of depends for me i like to get the piston mounted to the shaft um, and then I will put it into the damper cylinder, slide the O-ring on, slide the guide on, then put the uh, the bottom damper cap on, um, because essentially that that means that your when you when you do the bottom damper cap up, you're compressing the O-ring, and as you compress the O-ring, it bites onto the shaft a little bit. And if you do that, if you do that up tight, and then put the uh, the damper shaft through, the uh, threads in the bottom of the damper shaft can actually cut into the O-ring and cause problems later down the line. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm kind of waffling a little bit at the moment because I'm trying to remember <laughs> all of these basic little tips. Um, yeah, that... so with the, with the O-ring, maybe a good thing to mention is that it's, it's always useful to either put a drop of, uh, damper oil on them already. Yeah. Uh, like you say, um, trying to put it over the damper shaft can damage it. If you're lubing it up with a bit of damper oil or something like a green slime, not everyone likes to use it, but no. it's, uh. It's made specifically for this to sort of help with sealing and lubricating the o-ring um, you can prevent some of the damages um, yeah so the, the way so, i do it for example is the opposite i put the uh bushing the o-ring and the cap on it but not tightened yeah so i leave it loose then put the shaft through and then tighten it yeah so indeed tightening the bottom cap is usually something you do last that's yeah. what actually holds the oil inside as well it, it has to seal properly otherwise your damper starts leaking yeah um Oh, it's probably we should probably take a step back and mention that these are aluminium dampers we're um, we're looking at here, but the build is the same, exactly the same for plastic dampers. And the only thing you need to consider with plastic dampers is you really need to not over tighten them. Um, over tightening them won't just cause a restriction in performance; it can actually crack things. Um, but they're essentially the same. There is a huge upgrade, uh, or it is a huge upgrade to go from plastic dampers to aluminium dampers because the precision and tolerances are so much tighter. Um, and generally the specification will be slightly better with them as well. They'll generally come with better pistons um, because they can be made with a tighter tolerance because the uh, the the uh, the uh, damper cylinder's uh, tolerance is so tight from the factory that they, they know within a very small margin how big it's going to be. Um, but yeah, so... Usually, what, there's, more op sorry, usually just, there's more options for them as well. Yeah. Um, but just to go back to what I was saying about... Uh, uh, greasing the o-rings I, I don't use any green slime um, but that's because i use uh dampers that only use mineral oil and i found that with the green slime they some it sometimes breaks down and causes problems and needs the oil to be replaced more frequently um, and can leave gunk in the the oil um what i do instead is i uh when i when i'm assembling the dampers or rebuilding the dampers for at least sort of five or ten minutes um, generally as i'm putting the, the other parts together i will put all of the o-rings into a uh, ziploc bag and just put a few drops of oil in there um so they're just soaking for a few minutes um and that way when they go on they go on go they go on easily because they're lubed but also they don't catch and they don't tear or snag or pinch on anything um yeah yeah so it's it's good to remember that based on what oil you're using if it's mineral or silicon um you sort of choose your your components on that um, very much some of yeah. the o-rings they don't behave well with either or uh different oils um, some swell up with silicone, some swell up with mineral, yeah. uh, or even break down indeed. 
Uh, yeah. So basically you choose your O-ring based on that and also indeed your assembly method. Yeah, and, and you know, being an overdose driver, uh, I feel I should mention that all overdose dampers are designed to use overdose oil. Um, and it sounds a bit marketing-y to say um, that it's... Uh, different but it isn't it isn't the same as other mineral oils um it is mineral based um but it has some very clever technology behind it that basically makes it flow differently um through the piston holes um so if you're using overdose dampers you should be using overdose oil um, people might tell you you can use mst mineral oil or another brand of mineral oil. i really don't recommend it uh, if you use overdose stuff it lasts longer um, you don't have problems and generally i i replace my o-rings every 12 to 18 months um and that's normally just because i feel like i shouldn't push it any longer um but uh yeah so i mean it's also very cheap to replace so it's it's worth it yeah and they only cost a cost a few euros for a bag with multiple sets of o-rings so you can uh, replace them a couple yeah. times and i would i would highly recommend money. having um at least one set spare at all times um because sometimes through no fault of your own uh you'll end up with a bit of binding on a damper and all you have to do is strip it apart change the o-rings put it back together and it's good to go again um, and it can take just a few minutes but if you don't have that part you have to put it with a poorly performing car or actually an undrivable car in some situations um but it often uh, a symptom of knowing you've used the wrong oil or the wrong o-ring is um that your damper will stick there'll be the car won't uh, or the, the suspension won't move freely, but if you put a bit of pressure on it and compress it, then it starts working fine. Um, and that's generally that you've got either the wrong uh, O-ring or the wrong oil in there and something isn't happy. And it's also definitely a sign that you're going to need to change your O-ring soon uh, because that's essentially a warning that your car is not happy or your damper is not happy. And at some point it's just going to bind and not move in the future. But you can see in this diagram, they even recommend putting a bit of shock oil on the on the top. Um, when you're putting the diaphragm in place um, so i guess that's a very quick overview of the the basics of the damper but uh, one of the things that we mentioned is that you can tune the, the dampers so much um, and so the way you generally will do that is with the with pistons with the bladders which you can see there is uh, on the left is od 1173 um, and with the um, uh, the uh, ball end that goes on the bottom um which is 1171 and, and of course the oil and the oil is the big one um but uh pistons is the one that a lot of people dive into very early on when they get into get into no dampers um overdose pistons on a garm for example are standard with two hole um which is they're quite slow uh they're designed for um polished concrete and lower grip surfaces so they give you stability um the the piston basically moves through the oil and the holes allow the oil to or the holes control the resistance that the oil gives so um you have generally you'll have two three four five six hole pistons um or if you're axon 16 hole pistons uh, which are incredibly fast um but they you can slow your dampers down by making holes smaller or reducing the number of holes uh, but you can also slow your dampers down by changing oils and in the uk i see a lot of people get some very fancy new overdose hg uh, dampers you know almost a couple of hundred euros worth of dampers and one of the first things they do is drill the pistons out to be massive um, <laughs> but what they need to realize is that they've come that way for a reason and actually overdose don't offer like three by one mil um, holes for their pistons uh, for that particular damper because they don't feel like it needs it on any surface. Um, if they did, they would release them. Um, they think that you should change the oil, and I fully agree with that, because pouring out a few cc's of oil um, and replacing it with something slightly thicker or thinner means it's a few seconds, or a few minutes, I should say. It's not difficult, and it's reversible. If it doesn't work, you can go back to where you were. Uh, once you've drilled your pistons, the only option to do is order some more. Um, and... It's not to say you shouldn't ever drill pistons, um, but you should only drill pistons when you've tried everything else and it's not working. Um, because quite frequently I see people drilling pistons where I think they should be changing dank ramble. Um, so it's a bit of a bit of a bit of an odd one for me sometimes. Um, also, also, if you're changing the pistons, it usually means you're taking out the damper shafts as well. And that's coming back to the story of earlier, where assembling yeah. or deassembling your your dampers basically 
can cause damage to your o-ring so you're not only changing pistons but highly highly likely you'll have to replace the o-rings as well um and it's it's just quite a bit of a task yeah and and you it's have to bleed them quickly do at the track side yeah um and if you do it quickly at the track side you're probably going to redo it again um there, there are ways to do dampers very quickly um but if you rush them unless you're super advanced you're probably going to regret it i think um but yeah, so anyway, so you can change the the, the piston hole size um, as a general rule. Um, three hole pistons are kind of the most common, I think. And that varies from 0 0.6 millimeters to one millimeter generally, um, depending on brand. Um, I personally run, if I'm running a, a standard damper like one of these, I run like a three by one millimeter um, generally for carpet and also for concrete. And all I do is I change the, the oil. Um, generally i'll run 10 weight on uh concrete and 15 or 20 on carpet depending on the, the track layout um, sometimes i'll also run 10 um if i want a bit more response but essentially that's what it comes down to you're you're tuning the the speed uh, that the piston travels through the oil um so essentially the the speed that your suspension suspension is moving uh, based on how much response you want versus uh stability and it is a bit of a trade-off the more response you have the less stable your car will be um and so it's just a case of finding the balance that you like but like i say when you just swap oils it's very quick to change and actually when you're super fancy um you can have a tray full of different dampers um, from all the different kits you've got and you can prepare them by building different sets so i've got sets in there that are with 10 weight oil or 15 weight oil or 20 weight oil or 25 or whatever um and different pistons so you know it's not something I recommend everybody goes out and does in initially, but when you buy a second chassis that you're not taking to the track, well, you can take the dampers off that and take them with you. Um, if you're leaving something at home, you essentially have a spare set of dampers. Especially if you build them up with the exact same components and just change one thing. Yeah, uh, It's really easy. You just take one set off, put the others back on, and yeah. you're back on the track within a couple of minutes. Um, and you can easily test if something works. I mean, you can even go a bit extreme and go for like, a, a lot heavier oil or a lot yeah. lighter uh, and then you can at least feel if it makes sense to do this if you get the effect that you want yeah um, and then if, afterwards you can always of course fine-tune it but yeah because when you're when you're first starting out you might change uh to a thicker oil but actually what you needed to do is put a stiffer spring on um and uh, there's lots of as i say they, everything kind of works together so when you change one thing um it's one part in a chain and it may help uh it may make things worse or it may make no difference as far as you're concerned. Um, but yeah, so the other part that uh, sort of interacts with the oil directly that you can change is the bladder um, or the diaphragm, which is, as I said before, 1173 on the on the left there. Um, not everyone offers different stiffnesses, um, but most companies do, or most dampers have something available for them. So Overdose, for example, have three different options. They've got the standard version, a soft version, and a firmer version. And the um, the purpose of the the diaphragm is to basically uh, push the piston um, back down. Uh, what it does is, as the piston moves up through the oil, it pushes against the the, the diaphragm, which is made of a rubber, um, which expands or flexes. And as the pressure is relieved from the the piston moving, uh, it wants to return back to normal. So it just ha adds a little pressure to 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 put things back to normal. Um, and it basically controls the rebound in the in the damper. So, as I say, if you if you have a uh, a stiffer one that happens faster, if you have a softer one that happens slower. So it's another that's a real sort of fine tuning. When you've got your dampers almost right, that's where you fine tune it. And again, I, I often see people running the the softest version trying to get extra rebound, and it it works the opposite way. <laughs> um, but also, a quicker way to to tune your rebound is to um, is to assemble them or you seal your dampers with the uh, shaft in the position you want them to sit in so if you if you assemble the uh, the damper you see here uh, fully extended i don't know if that's visible let's see if i can get that closer um fully extended well that's where it's going to want to push back to when there's no pressure on it but this these dampers were assembled uh about halfway so they pull back in when they're released and if you push them in they push their way back out again so um that's that's their sort of natural resting position and you can use that generally on the front of uh, a drift car i have them fully extended generally 
um, so they would be assembled and sealed. And by sealed, I mean literally when you screw the cap on for the last time, that's that's essentially creating memory from where that where that damper wants to sit. Um, so you can go in and set that to uh, wherever you want it to be. On the front, like I say, fully extended is generally where I'd go. There are exceptions to that. Um, on the rear, uh, either fully extended or about halfway um, is generally where I'd go just to help the car want to sit sit down a bit more and help speed up a bit of movement. Um, you can get handy little tools like this. Um, this one is a 3D printed or one. Like this. <laughs> yep. Tosh has the fancy version. I have uh, a nice gift from Haroon. Um, and all you do with these is as you're assembling the damper, you choose, let's say, five millimeters. You put it over the shaft and you compress it so that it's at five millimeters. Although this one doesn't actually, I put it on upside down. That's why. Uh, so five millimeters, you do that. So it's at five millimeters. And then you, then you put the cap on and you know both dampers are assembled the same. Um, if you um if you're eyeballing it you probably should just go fully extended um because having as i said before having something slightly different left or right can cause so many more problems um and it's probably not worth trying to get right you can use things like um i've seen people use uh like a a, a tool uh, a screwdriver tip and things like that to get a standard measurement that works just fine um, but it means that that's your measurement you, you can't choose slightly less on, uh, on most standard dampers, you can actually also use the spring retainer that's uh, holding the spring on the bottom. If you flip it upside down and put it over the shaft, yeah. I don't know if you can see it. You can uh, you can use that to sort of set the set the rebound as well. Yeah, that's find that, something, find that's something a good tip. Handy. Yeah. Um, the the trouble with that, as I say, is you're limited on the um, the uh, the size that you can choose. Uh, just to grab a quick question from chat, uh, I can see Akhtar's asked if uh, 1169 works with silicon or mineral. Uh, it's mineral oil only, and I recommend very specifically overdose oil only. Um, they will work with others, but um, they will last a significantly longer amount of time with overdose oil. Um, yeah, so the nice, th the nice thing you can sort of remember is with the uh, modern MST chassis, uh, overdose chassis, the oil they sell with it, or they um, basically have included in the kit, is mineral oil. So that basically means that your O-rings will also be uh, suitable for mineral oil. Yeah. The problem with those is that usually they swell up when you put silicon in it. Um, so yeah, I would try to avoid that. If you want, if you want to use silicon oil, just find some O-rings that are uh, definitely meant for that. Yeah. Uh, so so, so generally, touring car um... O-rings will usually have that. Yeah, generally with MST, yeah. um, the, the quick way to remember it is if it's got blue O-rings, it's for mineral oil, and if they're red O-rings, they're for silicon. Um, but everyone has sort of switched to mineral oil, um, I don't know, in the last three or four years, and the reason for that is because your dampers will last longer with mineral oil. Um, it's, I think it's more stable, um, it takes longer to break down, um, and I think the performance is probably more consistent as well. Um, and it's available in a much lighter viscosity, which is something um, most rear-wheel drive drift cars have been using uh, the past couple of years, where we go down to 15, 10, uh, 5 weight. Uh, Even oils. zero, yeah. Yeah. Um, which I mean, is something it's... that's tricky with silicon. Yeah. Um, I think, like Tosh says, whatever whatever comes with the chassis or with the damper set. So if you buy an MST damper set, they've got a little bottle of MST mineral oil hidden in the base of the box. Um, if you buy an overdose kit, they come with it. Um, if you buy overdose HG dampers, they don't include any, but they assume if you're buying high-level dampers, you have an understanding that you use overdose oils with their with their dampers. Uh, and to be honest, I've seen people running other oils, and the dampers didn't feel anywhere near as nice with the HGs. Uh, it's very important on an HG to use them. Um, and uh, for anyone that doesn't know, the, the, when I refer to the overdose HG damper, they are a very high-quality um, incredibly high tolerance um or tight tolerance uh damper set that are uh, they have extra adjustment available so you can adjust the preload without changing the spring um and yeah they're they're the best they're the ones you you you, you aim for um i would say they're very expensive i'm not going to pretend they're not um but they're good enough that it's all i run on any chassis now um because i i, I can't live without them they it's like when you go to a very nice tool set you just don't want to go back to cheap tools um but yeah so anyway um i was talking before about the the o-rings uh, sorry the, the diaphragms um 
diaphragm tuning isn't something i'd recommend that you get into until much further down the line if ever maybe um, uh Maybe one of the quick things you can do is that uh, often the dampers come with a little bit of foam. Yes. Uh, a little foam bushing you can put on top of the bladder or yeah. the diaphragm. And that uh, gives you sort of the same effect as a stiffer uh, diaphragm. Yes. One very important thing. Try. Yeah. One very important thing to remember with the diaphragm is that the top of it must be dry. Um, people will often fill the damper and then put the, the, the bladder or diaphragm on top and then a bit of... Uh, overflow gets into it and there's a pool of oil in the top that oil will hinder performance um, so you must remove that with a bit of tissue um, but especially if you're going to put a piece of foam on there you definitely need to remove any oil because that foam will just soak it up and then that side will have a different rebound to the other side because it's got a harder uh, piece of foam on and a heavier piece of foam on um, so it doesn't move as well. The other thing that will often um, and this this diagram is perfect to, to illustrate it is uh, Damper sets will often come with two sets of uh, upper mounts or upper uh, ball ends. So you see here, 1171-1 uh, uh, says no hole. Well, you'll often get them where they're sealed like this, where there's no hole, or they also come with an additional option that has uh, an aeration hole, which is normally, I don't know, a half millimeter hole, something like that, uh, drilled through. And what that does is it reduces rebound because it uh, lets pressure out of the top of the, the uh, diaphragm. So as the diaphragm moves up, it lets air escape from the the uh, um, from the cell, uh, from the damper assembly, and so there's less pressure pushing it back down. Um, generally, I don't ever run those with for drift chassis. Um, I have t tested them and used them in the past, but as a general rule, I just avoid them. Um, <laughs> they they don't tend to work as well unless you're looking for a really stable and slightly numb feeling car. Um, but I, I'm not a big fan. But, um... maybe maybe one other thing to mention about the diaphragm is that it it takes some some practice to make sure you put it on correctly without letting any air in be trapped inside of the damper or maybe overfilling it that it's not sitting exactly flush on the top of the damper cylinder uh, which means it's sort of floating on a bit of oil if you then screw the top cap on you put pressure on the dampers and your rebound will be off yeah so the the, the way you should put your damper um uh, in fact, have I got a cup? Never mind. Um, the way you should put your um, diaphragm on is if this is the, the cylinder, my hand, um, you should roll the, um, the diaphragm on like that. If you just do this, you'll trap air. Um, you should always put it on. So as this comes on, it's pushing air out of the side. Um, so it squeezes any air that's on top of the, the oil to the side. Um, a very, an incredibly basic uh, pointer to mention as well is you should fill the cylinder with oil. Um, if anything, it needs to overflow a little bit. Um, but yeah. if you if you put the diaphragm on and no oil pours over the side, you've got air in there because there was there was because uh, the the diaphragm has a uh, uh, has a a part that goes into the oil. And so if you put that into the oil and nothing flows over the edge, then there's definitely air in the cylinder and there wasn't enough oil. And you should stop at that point and add oil um, because otherwise you will have air in and your dampers won't feel good. Um, and will need to be rebuilt sooner. Yeah, so um, if you're looking at, at the side of the damper, basically, you can see the oil bulging up a little bit. Yeah, that's, let me uh, uh, see. I've also got the MST there. manual here. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to do the unthinkable, and I'm going to make this uh, um, a bit bigger, <laughs> just so that we can see this. Uh, just cover us for a second. Um, but if you see this, uh, where the, in the bottom left, um, in fact, I'm just going to make it super big to show this. In the center of the screen there, you've got the oil seal diagram um, above the red text, and you can see the cutaway shows how the diaphragm sits inside the oil. Um, so you can see exactly what we're talking about there, where um, um, they're wiping away excess oil, and that's basically what you need to do. Like I say, if you don't have that, you should definitely start again. Um, and empty the oil out and or not necessarily empty the oil out but but add some more oil because um it's you're going to need it it's it's not going to be the the worst thing you can have with dampers is a bit of air in there um it's just not not what you need at all it's the sort of enemy of good good smooth dampers and the goal with all of this is to have very very smooth dampers um because uh it's what controls and, the car and also consistent consistent dampers if one of them has a little bit of oil and the they will not 
work the same. Yeah. Um, you, you definitely want them to be as consistent as possible, at least uh, from the front two and the rear two. Yeah. I think it's, so, um, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Speaking about filling it up with oil and getting air trapped inside, how do you feel about the, the damper pumps, the vacuum pumps you can use? Um, I think for a beginner, they are fine. Um, but actually, uh, one thing I learned after many, many, many years of using a vacuum pump is when you use a vacuum, you will, you're actually causing damage to your O-rings as you're assembling the damper. Um, it will pull the oil, uh, it, it, create, it basically creates a vacuum, uh, around the O-ring as well. And what that will do is, uh, allows oil to replace any air that was available to the O-ring. Um, so it will start to absorb, uh, oil sooner and deeper. Um, I, I stopped using them, I, I think three years ago, something like that. Um, I, I basically had a, um, I had a session with Yodo, the overdose designer, and I asked him about it, and he basically gave me a demonstration and said, and explained everything to me about why, why you shouldn't use them. And the way I now do it is I pull a vacuum uh, with my thumb, and I'm just wondering if I've got any dampers without a cap on. No, I don't. Um, Maybe just to quickly show it, this is the, uh, yes, the pump we're talking they're about. They're shop pumps. Um, there's many yeah, different brands that sell them. Um, but essentially what you do inside. is you, you put your dampers inside without uh, the top assembly. So just with the oil sat in there before you put the diaphragm and top caps on. And then you uh, use the pump to pull the air out of there. Um, and the and what, what does happen, and it looks quite a cool, is you can see the air bubbles being pulled up from the bottom. Um, and that's your goal. Uh, air bubbles in the oil, which they will inevitably, especially if it's a new set that you're building, because you're pouring oil on top of air and you'll essentially trap some at some point. Um, but what happens when you when you use the pump is, um, as I say, you basically start the degradation process uh, immediately and you accelerate it. So they will be fine initially, but you'll probably find they leak sooner or the O-rings need replacing because they've swollen sooner. Um, and you just start with problems. So what I do, if you ignore this cap because I don't want to take it off and get messy, is I'll put my thumb over the top um, and pull the piston down, which you can't see because my hand's in the way, so I'm going to use my finger instead of my thumb. So this would be across like this. You pull the piston down, then you release it, pump it up, which pushes the air up to the top. Then you put it back on, pull it down, and just repeat that until there's no more air. The 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 tricky part with that, and the reason I say it's, it's okay for beginners to use a shock pump, is there's a skill to learn where you use your thumb, but you're... Uh, you need to use just enough pressure to to seal it, but you actually need as you um, as you're pushing the air out. Um, sorry, I gave the description the wrong way around. Before you you push up, um, you need to feel the air leaving. So as you pu push the shaft up with your thumb sealed, uh, not like I just said it, um, you need to feel a small amount of air leaving, but not oil. And then as you lift to pull it back down, um, it refills. And then you repeat that and you keep doing that. And what happens is um, you're basically pushing the air bubbles out. And and then when, what you will need to do is top up the oil because your thumb will sit inside the oil a bit like a, like a uh, diaphragm. Um, but when since I've started doing that, I've basically, I almost don't need to re rebuild my dampers anymore. Um, the only exception to that is when they fly. Sometimes I have a problem because of the pressure changes in the cargo in the plane. Um, but at home, I like once a year, absolute soonest. Um, somebody's just asked a question in chat about does drilling pistons for more holes make for faster rebound? Um, it basically makes for the piston to, to flow faster through. So it actually it's faster compression and, uh, rebound can be affected negatively. Um, because it depends if you end up with two big holes by that point, then there's not enough surface area on the piston to be pushed down. Um, but the compression, you, you do it for compression is the reason you, you drill the holes. So if you're, uh, it, basically if you're going to, if you're going to drill pistons, you need to maybe think about changing your, um, your diaphragm, which is something firmer to help out. Um, but it's kind of a trial and error thing. It, it all depends. You know, you can go from a, uh, a two by 0 0.6 millimeter 
um, piston to his 2 by 0 0.7 millimeter piston and you won't have too much of a negative impact but if you go from a 2 by 0 0.6 millimeter, millimeter piston to a 4 by 1 millimeter you're going to have a very big change and probably going to struggle with some rebound but yeah um and the other thing that we haven't mentioned on this is the um the ball end that goes on the bottom of the damper shaft um most manufacturers do different sizes um overdose in particular have two different sizes included with their dampers so if you're not paying attention you can end up with very different length dampers because you'll have a few millimeters different left to right or front to back or you know even just one damper on a set um and so you need MST to pay attention well, by the way mst does MST but msts also, are uh... they're, they're labeled generally so it's a little bit yeah. easier because it, they they generally i think they still still do it but they um they still do yeah so they, they uh, i don't i'm almost sizes. certain this isn't going to show but printed on the bottom no i'm not gonna be able to show that on this camera but printed on the bottom or or molded on the bottom it says zero uh, 2.5 or five um and that the way they do it is they extend the plastic um to make it longer um and the reason they, they do that is because uh, that affects your damper length, um, which can affect your damper stroke. Um, but a very important tip is when you're screwing these on the bottom, I would recommend using uh, damper pliers like this. And they've got a, a bit of nylon or Delrin or something in the, in the jaws to hold the shaft of the, uh, of the damper without marking it. Because if you get scratches or dirt or anything on the shaft of your damper, it goes through your O-ring and can cut it, uh, which then causes them to leak or fail uh, earlier. So you hold it like this and you screw the ends on uh, or screw them off, and that's that's fine. If you don't have access to these, which you don't when you're first starting out, you can use a pair of side cutters, but it's absolutely critical that you don't hold the middle of the shaft. Uh, if you do that, you've just killed the damper and you need to buy a new uh, set of... Uh, of shafts what you do is you hold the very 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 top thread um which again i'm not gonna be able to show you because this camera is not going to focus um <laughs> but uh you literally hold the inside the thread that's been cut for the um the ball end but it's really important that you hold the exact same point on all four dampers or at least the the front and rear dampers because that is setting the length of the damper it's setting how much stroke you're going to have and I've seen it many times where there's three or four millimeters difference because people have just wound them on by hand. And as long as they're tight and they're not going to fall off, they think that's okay. But actually what you're doing is, in actual fact, um, I, know I don't have a diagram of that, but um, if you grab anything other than the thread, you're going to mark the shaft. And as that goes through and compresses, it's just going to end up with uh, damage to the O-ring no, uh, no matter how much you don't want that. It's just going to happen for sure. Um, so it's thought... also the same that if you if you don't put the ball end on for, uh, far enough, you'll end up with a bit of thread or something else sticking out above the ball end. Yes. And then the same thing can happen. You can either compress the the shock too far with the piston hitting the diaphragm, or getting the thread stuck in the O ring. So yeah, always yeah. Uh, always check afterwards as well. Just hold them up next to each other and make sure they're on exactly the same. Um, and then you know uh, at least the length of the damper will be the same. Yeah, and, and just to go to a really basic thing, um, if you've built your dampers and um, you should you should wipe them off. You should wipe them off with some tissue paper or something like that and make sure they're dry uh, from the outside. You know, when this when it's at this point, when it's assembled, you should clean everything off. Um, you've put your spring retainer on, you've done everything. Uh, all you've got to do is put your spring and lower uh, spring retainer on. Um, and the reason for that is because... You need to a keep them clean, and if you're driving on carpet with a um, a damper that's covered in oil, it's just going to have everything <laughs> stick to it, or dust, or dirt, or concrete dust, or whatever. But also, um, if they're clean, and then you check them a couple of days later, and they've got oil on them, you know they're leaking. Um, and if they're leaking, they need rebuilding because uh, when your damper leaks, there's now air inside because something has replaced that oil. Um, and it might mean you need to replace O-rings. It might mean something was damaged during assembly. Or it might just be that um, uh, something wasn't quite happy when it's gone together. I've seen it many times, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to show you this, but the, the guide that goes in the bottom in the diagram, 11, it's OD1172. Um, it sort of generally, on most brands, it will clip into the bottom. Um, uh, the bottom, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the part that screws on the bottom of the damper. Brains gone. Cap, yeah. yeah, the bottom cap. Um, it will generally like snap into place. And you'll see people that will assemble it and they don't snap. Um, even though they look like they're in position, 
it, it's not a hard and fast rule because sometimes it's a very subtle thing. But um, if they don't quite go in square into the cap, if they're slightly at an angle, then um, they're actually compressing the O-ring on one side more than the other side. Um, and you, it, it just doesn't leave for a very happy damper. Um, <laughs> but uh, we'll just not seal properly, basically. Yeah. So. Um, and and can also push the uh in extreme cases it can push the shaft so it's not going up and down straight it's actually pushing against the cylinder wall with the piston um so yeah option parts for dampers like this um if you do you know if you've been running for a while and you're looking to make them a bit smoother um or you want to change it up a bit you can generally for most brands you can get uh replacement piston sets as i said before in different hole sizes and hole numbers or hole counts um the other thing you can get is um, like just, yeah, so exact, perfect example. I was going to say you can get what's generally known as a machined piston. So a standard piston is molded um, in general. Uh, I'm sure somebody is an exception to that. Um, but a standard piston is just molded plastic. Um, and it's a pretty good part. But with everything that's molded, there are variances between batches. Um, and so what might not be it might not be the exact size it was intended to be or exactly round uh, mm-hmm. a machine piston takes a sheet of plastic and they cut it um, so it is exactly to size and they're gem- generally if you're buying machine pistons they've been uh, you'd hope they've been checked by a human with good quality control um, but also the hole sizes are exact um, and if you drill a piston um, you will often end up with some uh, uh, swarf. You know, you'll have the the part that's the the plastic that's been removed from drilling will come out, and you'll have some bird edges, um, which might not seem like a big deal, but that changes the performance per hole. Um, and if you have to, if you think about a piston moving through oil, it needs to move through as parallel as possible, um, because uh, that's how it's most efficient, and that's how it's uh, smoothest and feels the best. If one hole has loads of burring or it isn't drilled quite properly um, and is essentially a smaller hole than the others, it might twist a bit. And it's trying to do this, which then puts wear on the cylinder walls and the piston itself and the guide and the O-ring and everything will just wear faster. So it's not something you can pay too much attention to, but before you build any dampers, you should absolutely inspect them. And on a lot of the molded standard pistons, uh, not so much now, but a few years ago, you would have the round piston and it'd have a little tag where it's been broken off a, a sprue. And so you'd always end up having to get a blade and just trim that back a little bit. Um, and if you didn't do that, you'd end up with scratches up and down the, the cylinder wall. And in you know six months or a year, you end up needing to buy new cylinder walls, uh, new cylinders because the walls have been damaged. Um, and in general, if you, if, you, if you take the care and time to build a damper well and you know when you're finished you feel it and make sure it's feeling smooth and it and it's doing what you're expecting and it's doing the same as the left and right you know the left and right pairs are doing the same thing um they last a long time and you generally don't replace parts because of where you replace parts because you want to tune them or just refresh them up a bit you know um if you're if you just slap them together and don't pay attention um you end up with extra wear or damage or broken parts. I mean, I've seen broken guides. Um, old school guides used to be um, just a, a essentially a spacer. They used to be like a, a nylon spacer that was that would just sit in the cap nicely, um, and they would often warp and you know twist a little bit or or uh, become ovaled, and then they'd just leak. But the new type, or, as or you need also have uh, have some of the mold flash. Yes. Uh, it's it's the same with the pistons actually. I think this is a good tip for the beginners to indeed check the pistons. Yeah, it's not it's not just where it was attached to the sprue because you can have a flat spot or even uh, a bit of a burr or something sticking out that's rubbing against the cylinder wall. So if you still haven't cut off the sprue or even if it's been done for you and they just come separate in the kit, just check them over. But also check the holes. Yes. Because what often happens is that they have a bit of mold flash, which is basically just covering half of the hole. Um, and then you get the same problems you were talking about, yeah. where it's not moving evenly, where one damper might be uh, different to another simply because the whole size. And, and it might exactly only be it might only be half of one hole out of you know yeah. the four different pistons that you've got. Um, and another really important thing with pistons, which is um, more important actually on on dampers that are assembled the way the image is here, um, you need to make sure that you put the pistons the right way up, um, or at the very least the same way on all of them. 
um, often they have like a little dimple or something on one side yeah so you can uh, or but maybe you, you a, can you can see in this diagram um on 1160 at the top the piston it has two you can see the two holes um and i thought i saw a dimple but i was being i was imagining it but uh they they will often have markers on the overdose pistons have markers on um they have a little dimple in the middle of um on one side and uh you have either no dimple or one dimple or two dimples and that tells you the piston hole size um so generally no dimples is 0 0.5 millimeters one dimple is 0 0.6 millimeters and two dimples is 0 0.7 millimeters and then obviously you count whether it's two three um or, or whatever um, but that's a little guide that they do. Not everybody does that, but they will often have um, something in the manual that indicates which is up. Let's have a look and see if the MST one yeah. does, because I don't actually remember if they do. Um, I have a set here. Let me have a quick look. <laughs> I'm just going to stretch this and make it ugly again. But uh, Yeah, and sometimes they also have a collar or something. on one. I thought um, they did. No, they don't seem to have anything there, but um, no, no, they these, just got these the don't have any indications whatsoever. No. Um, but uh, but if if there is nothing, then generally they can um, be installed either way. But what you need to remember is that um, some pistons, like the overdose HG pistons, have a they have an indent because that's designed for a uh, spacer to sit, and so that has to fit a certain way. Um, if it, if you put it on upside down, the piston isn't going to be where it's expected to be, so the dampers aren't going to work very efficiently. Um, but like or, I say, or you the, might not even get the C clip on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which causes them to fly all over the room, which happened on many occasions. To me, at least. Yes, millions of times, <laughs> often on old live streams. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, but the the most important thing is with with everything on a damper is that you make left and right the same. So if you're not sure on something, make sure that the front and rear dampers, left and right, you do it the same way for at least those front and rear. It it's okay if they're a bit different. Um, but left and right will just cause you huge problems if they're if they're different. Um, but the this isn't going to work because these are very old dampers that have been squished up in a box. Um, but when you're finished, you should uh, get your two dampers and at least push them together. And there you go; they're completely stuck. But they should they need to come out with roughly the same rate. Um, the 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 closer to exact they are, the better the dampers. Um, these dampers haven't been used for maybe three years, so they've got old oil in. Um, but like if, if, for example, if one goes in, this one is, you can see that they need a rebuild because the right one goes in is now all the way in and the left one still has some to go. Um, so they need a rebuild. Um, if you aren't sure, you can just run them and try them. Um, if you're going to be going to a really important competition or something where you're not going to get a lot of track time, just rebuild them before you get there. If you're not sure, um, and if you're if you're if you're new if you're really new to all of this and you're not sure how to do any of this, any good track will have local guys that will sit and help you. Um, I never recommend that you let people do this for you. You should learn this as soon as possible because building dampers is a really important part of this hobby, um, and it's a very common thing you have to do to to tweak and tune your car. And you need to become comfortable with it as soon as possible. And a lot of the the, the problem you have is a lot of the um, the way you learn this stuff is by feeling. With dampers you need to feel what a smooth damper feels like because a really smooth damper surprises people because it's a much more precise thing than they're expecting um and but also uh when you've got air in your damper that feels different to when there's grit in the o-ring um or dirt on the shaft or a scratch on the shaft they all have different feelings and you can feel it uh, the more experience you have the the sooner you can identify it and the um um the the easier it becomes and the, the faster you become at, at localizing the problem and just getting straight to the fix instead of trying to you know do an autopsy and work out where the problem is and take every single part off and you know sometimes or quite frequently you don't have to take the piston out um you just need to uh change the oil top, or top of the oil and, yeah. uh, and go again um or maybe there's, you there's... maybe you need to take the the ball end off the bottom and slide the piston and shaft out and change an o-ring um, but if you're not sure and you start trying to take uh, take the C clips off and they're pinging all over the room and you lose them and then you can't put your damper back together and you've got all this hassle, um, sometimes it's or quite often it's it's avoidable. Um, With air trapped inside, often you can hear it as well. It starts squeaking or or making these bubbly noises. Yes. Um, if that happens, then it's probably not good. No, and and I mean in general, if there's air in your damper, you can still run. You know, you could finish your day if the car's not horrendous. Um, but 
you should change it as soon as reasonably possible. Um, you know, as long as it's not scratching or damaging something, you can carry on. You're just you're driving with reduced performance, basically. Um, I mean, I have had it. I have to be honest. I have had it before where I've flown to Japan, had my dampers leak on the plane over there because of the air pressures. Arrived, put my car down, and the car drove amazing. And it wasn't until halfway, you know, through the next day that I realised that my dampers had leaked. But by leaking, they'd actually improved the rebound situation and made the car better. <laughs> so you know, sometimes you get lucky with with cockups. Um, one thing I don't think we mentioned is uh, on this diagram uh, on the right hand side, you've got uh, OD seventeen twenty seven. Uh, which is an O-ring that sits inside of the uh, other OD1727 uh, part, which is the uh, upper spring retainer. And this part here, uh, which is the same, is used to adjust the the uh, upper mounting point for the spring. So you can compress that to make the spring smaller, um, or you can extend that to make the spring uh, taller. So you're changing the preload on the spring, essentially. But the O-ring that goes so inside of there... It's another reason to uh, to oil the... Oil yeah, the that's, what the it, cylinder. that's what I was getting to. So, so it doesn't stick, yeah. Yeah, you can either oil the threads on the cylinder or you can oil that O-ring. Um, it's not only so it doesn't stick, but quite often you'll just cut that O-ring to pieces um, as you screw mm. it on. And, it's, and, and also sometimes it'll be almost impossible to screw on because they can be very tight because they're being compressed uh, between two pieces of aluminium in this case. Um, and just by oiling that with some with some shock oil, you make your life a lot easier and also that part will move because the problem you have is when you're trying to adjust this on a car if you're just trying to turn this and if, and the top and bottom are locked off and this is really tight you just start unscrewing the top and if you don't spot that in time you let air into your dampers and then you have to take it off and rebuild it rather than just the quick adjustment you wanted um but if you if you loop these uh, this one has gone really stiff because it's been sat there if i just there we go now it's now it's moving okay um but that's dry because it's been sat there for a long time um, as I say, I use the the overdose HG dampers, so this is my tray of non HG dampers, um, which was to hand. Uh, but these are, uh, it's really important that you can move them freely. And again, if you if you work that out before you put it all on the car and before you're at a track, and that's wrong, you can take the time to fix it when you're at home or you know in your pits before you've got to be on track, and you end up with a lot less rushing and stress and and hassles and that kind of thing. Um, but I think they're, they're most of the, the basic tips I think we can cover. Um, you can see down here as well that they mentioned that the overdose damper should be assembled with three millimeters preload applied. Um, that's a really important thing to measure because, again, left to right really matters on these things. If that's three millimeters and the other side is five millimeters, well, not only are the dampers going to behave differently because there's different forces on the springs, but actually adjusting that changes the uh, the corner weight of the car. So, it, you know... With corner weighting a car, you're moving weight from one corner to the opposite corner on the front, and you'll end up with one side of the rear that's lighter than the rear side of the rear of the rear essentially, and you'll end up with a car that doesn't want to behave or drives very differently left to right. Um, one thing to always remember if you're if you're new to this is if your car is, does left hand corners better than right hand corners, um, first you should check the steering and make sure your steering lock is even and your Ackerman is correct and balanced and even. Uh, the next thing you should check is your dampers and springs because um, normally it's one of those two things, almost certainly. Um, or, or wheels rubbing maybe, but... Yes, yeah. They, it, but it's definitely worth checking your dampers. And like I say, um, one a handy tool which I forgot to grab when you're doing this is also to grab some calipers um, so you can measure things. You know, to, to, to get that three millimeter measurement, just pop your calipers in there, make sure it's three millimeters, make sure the other side is three millimeters, and then your front or rear, whichever the opposite um, to what you're doing right now is, is even left to right as well. And make sure that the damper, uh, the length that you have here, so from the uh, ball end to the uh, the bottom cap, measure that, make sure that's the same left to right. Um, if anything is different left to right, the car is just gonna be uh, not ideal. You might get away with it, and it might not be that bad if it's a very small difference. Um, generally, as a as a sort of golden rule, um, thicker oils hide things like that a bit better than thinner oils, um, just because everything reacts slower, so you get a bit more time. Um, it's it's just always worth taking that extra time. And like I say, if you spot something is wrong after you're finished, don't get disheartened. Just, just crack on and do it. Um, just fix the problem because. Putting it off doesn't make it any better, and pretending it wasn't wrong doesn't make it any better. Um, it just it becomes one of those things, especially when you're new. You'll make rookie mistakes. You'll do you have to do something two or three times. Um, you might damage something when you're putting it in, but if you take your time, 
Um, and like I say, if you, I think if you're brand new to the hobby and you're doing dampers for the first time, it's okay to take it to a track and ask for some help. Um, you should maybe ask for help before you arrive at the track um, so you're not turning up on a busy day or a, uh, a day where there's not so much help available. Um, but any experienced driver will help new guys because they remember what it's like to be trying to work this stuff out. It <laughs> it can be a bit of a, uh, a sort of, it can seem like a bit of a black art, um, but in reality, it's all really basic stuff that just, it, it's all about care and focus uh, more than anything else. Um, there's there's a lot of little tip, tips and trips you can give people um, and we'll probably cover in another episode when we get into more advanced things, but the basics of it are match left to right, make sure everything's smooth and don't over tighten things um but make sure everything is sealed you know that's that's the the long and short of it really um we've got another quick question from chat about uh what do we think of the effectiveness of rc926 uh spring damper rings um these are the, uh, the o-rings right that sit on top or on the bottom of the the spring yes yeah i've been running them in, in between the retainer and the spring right? yes yeah. yeah yeah um i've been running them for about a year uh on and off i bought the i think i bought three different versions um I don't really rate them. Um, they're not. I don't think they're on my car anymore. I don't. Basically, when I change the springs, I take them off, and occasionally I pop them back on. They have a bigger impact on uh, things like PTAR, with which are incredibly low grip. Um, the more I've used them, the more I've realised that they're not that helpful. You know, if you if you're looking for an edge, they're cheap enough. You can try some out. Um, you know, I think they're maybe two euros or something like that in price. They're very, very, very cheap. Um, on carpet, you're not going to notice a difference because they're too soft and the forces on the springs are already too high. Um, but I, I would say grab some, try them, see what you think. Um, they they come in different. I think they're different stiffnesses rather than thicknesses. But I'm trying to remember. Um, they're not my favorite the product. That it's, uh, it, the it? idea is that it's basically like a helper spring, right? Yeah, exactly. The the so idea it takes is that like it's... some of the fine the fine movements yeah and it's and it's as much about vibration i think as anything else um they're basically just to isolate uh vibration from what i can tell um which is not really a massive problem on dampers um if anything you might end up with a bit of numbness at the very start uh, of the damper movement um i thought initially they helped a lot but i realized it was just that i'd changed my settings and improved the damper <laughs> um so yeah there's that as well sometimes when people fit parts like this they'll do it to a freshly rebuilt damper and compare it against a, a well-used damper um so you should always rebuild the damper and run it before you try something like that so you can actually feel the difference um maybe uh maybe one more thing to talk about is setting the ride height because we talked about the yeah. preload a little bit um but obviously uh if you're setting ride height using the preload color you're not just changing the ride height you're also changing the spring rates basically yes um, yeah so there are other options as well to set ride height yeah uh, we've also covered the the ball ends already uh, some of the dampers they have adjustable top mounts like this one you can screw in and out these to, uh, these are the mst ones and they uh yeah. they replace uh, on this part it's 1173-1 so they sit inside the top cap and you just extend it or or, or um or reduce it to change the ride right. height um, so basically you're just changing the length of the of the damper without changing anything in terms of the springs or the, the stroke of the damper. Yes. It's um, just becoming a, a longer damper. Also some manufacturers like Yokomo have um different uh different upper upper mounts. Uh, the top ball uh, I think I may have some here. Um so, different lengths basically. Yes. Right? So you can see that this part here is uh well, you probably can't see very well, but this part is extended. Um, and in, in the box of the YD2, um, I believe they still do. They come with two different um, lengths. So again, make sure you're using the same ones that you mean to. Don't don't just grab the closest one because sometimes they're sometimes they're laid out on a sprue um, with a pair, then a pair, and things like that. So they might actually be different. Um, and the same with the it's the same when we're talking about having the aeration hole and not having the aeration hole. You need to check them and make sure you're getting the exact ones you you intend to get, um, particularly when you're making them from you. Um, because it's very easy to, you know, if, with the the um, aeration hole uppers, they only have a hole on one side in general. So if you're looking at it from the other side, you won't see that hole. So you'll just pick them up. Um, so you need to identify the ones with the hole and make sure you're not going for them, or you are if if that's your choice. Um, but just just so you're getting the one you want. So yeah, as as Taj says, you can actually adjust the 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 height uh, or the the length of the damper from the top and the bottom, um, or either. You don't have to do both. Um, 
and then there are things you can get a bit complicated with things like uh d like dampers that have longer cylinders and longer shafts uh, but that's a bit of a different story all right with the, yeah with the, the tr60s yeah. um what we're generally talking about here is the standard damper like this um in the aluminium version there are variations there are tweaks and different brands do things slightly differently but generally they all work the same they were all, all assembled the same but they use different shafts or they use different o-rings so you must use the correct part for them uh, but in term it, once you've built one you can build them all um in general uh, the like I say, the the overdose HGs are slightly different in the way they work, and there are some other brands that do things slightly differently. Um, but you know, if you get an RMX two uh, and put some aluminium dampers on it, if you get a, a YD two, if you get a Garm, the dampers are basically the same because it's a proven system that works well and offers you the adjustability that you are you're going to need. Um, if, even things like the big bore dampers from Yokomo or something that's Oh, sorry, Tyler, I'm just going to go. You just said uh, about the big bore dampers from Yokomo and then went quiet. Oh, yeah. Even those work pretty much the same way. They're just a slightly different size. Yes. Um, and then uh, it's also the same with, for example, three racing Sakuras and, and anything like that. Pretty yeah. much. Even even the plastic dampers, they sort of assemble the same way. Yes. They're, but yeah, indeed, they're less accurate. They have a bit of flex. Yeah. And some, sometimes they'll use a screw in place of a C clip or they'll use uh, yeah. a slight variation. But once you've done one, like I say, it's, it's easy enough to do the rest. Um, it's not something you 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 need to stress about, uh, especially when you're first starting out. If you're if you're new, um, the dampers that come with the kit are enough to get you going. Um, if you're going, if you've got plastic dampers with say uh, a, a basic entry level kit, uh, one of the first upgrades I'd recommend would be aluminium dampers, just because they are more precise, uh, they are more predictable, um, they are easier to assemble and get right. Sometimes with the plastic dampers, something's not quite to the right shape, so you'll end up with a little leak and things like that. It's rare, but it's it's not impossible. Um, and as we say, you can easily get upgrade parts for these to do uh, adjustable damper lengths or different pistons easily uh, are easily available, um, or even different diaphragms and things like that. So it's one of those things that um, you might not need that initially, but you know the dampers are generally fifty to seventy euros, uh, something like that for a set of aluminium ones, and that sort of gives you options further down the line um, that you're almost certainly going to want at some point. Um, particularly, it's, I think if it's one of the upgrades that, that has pretty much the highest impact on on your performance. Yeah, for um, sure. I, I cannot really think of anything else that would would have the same effect. Um, no. Maybe if you're changing steering geometry completely. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's indeed one of the first first things to get, and um, doing the maintenance on it will also be a lot easier because for most of the standard plastic dampers, you cannot really get any uh, replacement parts like the O rings and so on. They yeah. might be slightly different. Um, so that's, a, that's that, a good that and also with a lot of the plastic dampers the more you disassemble them and re reassemble them the worse the tolerances will get uh, because you're basically scratching away plastic every time you screw them in and out um and you know it's not too long until they start to leak or uh you know they they work sufficiently well for a beginner um but you know you're not going to get a few you're not going to get five years use out of the same set of dampers if you're if you're constantly stripping them and rebuilding them um but yeah. a, a set of dampers like this um you'll replace the o-rings and maybe pistons and the rest of it generally if you if you don't scratch the shaft will just last certainly the um the the caps and uh things like that just don't wear out um and again if you don't use any tools on them um uh, that we haven't mentioned here then they work pretty well um and won't get any damage on them um but yeah i think that's kind of probably as far as we should go for today like we said today's just about the basics um um sorry it's a bit scrambled but the it's it's been a while since i looked at dampers at, uh, on such a basic yeah. level and i kept remembering things uh that we need to not forget and i'm sure there's been plenty of things we've forgotten as well um after a while it really becomes a habit where rebuilding yeah. a damper or setting up a damper it's so so normal to you that you just do it without thinking about it yeah um, absolutely uh, you, you can anticipate all of the changes you're making and what it's going to do to uh the performance of your car so yeah, and it, it becomes it very. Well um, out, but it, this is one of those things. I think when you've been drifting for as long as we have, it's you have to really take a step back and remember what it was like to be the the new guy that doesn't already know this stuff. Um, or if you you know if you've been involved with touring cars, you probably know a lot of this stuff and have different ways of doing things, and and that's all fine. And you know this will be this will come very easily, um, or buggies or another discipline. But if you're new to RC in general, 
um i think getting damp is right was probably the thing that took me the longest to learn um and i would say only three years ago when i stopped using a shock pump did i start getting dampers properly right um i thought i got them right before then but when i when i really took the time to work on my um damper building skills uh, they it really stepped up a level and now i can build not only uh can i now make them work better but i make them last longer and i can build them faster you know i can probably put together a set of dampers in about 10 minutes and have them up and running as well as i need them um whereas when i first started it was probably a couple of hours to get dampers done um, it takes a while to get there but I, practice is not bad i mean if you're taking your dampers apart every couple of months um and do some maintenance on it and some rebuilding every time you'll be better at it and it'll be yeah. faster yeah um, so definitely definitely give it a try um, uh, and it, uh, it, it might also surprise you sometimes you think there's nothing wrong with it but then after doing a quick rebuild it works so much better but you're just used to the way it was um so yeah i just remembered a very good tip and then instantly forgot it again but um uh <laughs> the the key as i say the most important thing with all this is to take care um if you're taking these apart take your time um don't reuse your oil that's another thing we haven't mentioned don't reuse your oil um if if you've built your dampers this morning and then you know you you take them apart uh, or you're taking the tops off to reseal them because there's some air in there you can top them up that's okay but if you you know if you built them last month just pour the oil out and put new oil in it's not that expensive um but it does break down and it does lose its uh effectiveness and smoothness so you're far better to to just replace it and put fresh stuff in there um you can if you're changing brands um you can clean the dampers out um the cylinders um generally i'll just use a bit of tissue and get the most of it out it doesn't need to be perfect if you're changing different uh to different vis viscosity you don't need to um you, you should leave them upside down to drain for some time you know five or ten minutes but that's probably all you need to get out um i did re just remember the tip i forgot um so <laughs> when you're if you don't have a shock pump or you don't want to use a shock pump based on my advice and you're not comfortable with the thumb method that i described pretty poorly that i'll try and do a video on at some point on the channel um i would recommend that you build your dampers overnight um so you know maybe start at nine o'clock at night or something like that or or earlier and uh you can pump the piston up and down with the this is all with the cap off and no diaphragm by the way you pump the piston up and down and you will see some air moving around inside um if you can get yourself a shock stand or something like Taj mentioned um i haven't got anything to hand right now but if you can find something to stand the damper in you can leave it overnight and the longer you leave it the more air bubbles will escape um because they'll rise up slowly um what i would highly recommend doing is come back to it a couple of hours after you first do it um and just pump the piston again but also twist the piston because you're moving the holes around inside and where you may end up with an air bubble trapped underneath the uh the, the piston whereas when you rotate it it might then might then go through the hole and come out the top um, but then if you can leave it for as long as possible um without getting any dust or dirt in there obviously leave them covered if if you know you're in a dusty environment or something like that um but you'll find that they're a lot smoother than if you just seal them up and also if you're if you're building them the night before um or a couple of nights before you need them there's no rush so you can just leave them you don't have to even if you're using a shock pump even if you're using a thumb method you can just leave them to 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 just let the air out um and you'll find that you have a nicer damper also the lighter the oil is the quicker it goes with the game yes yeah the faster the bubbles move and if yeah. you want a quick a quick shock stand just get uh an old shoe box or something and poke four holes into it yes exactly it's, it's really that simple as long as they're sitting upright yeah or if you've got a something like an mst tire tool um you can use them as shock stands um the, the one thing you'll often find is you'll put something you put a damper in a stand and it's not quite high enough so the damper sits compressed which is fine but you need to remember that the, the piston isn't all the way to the bottom so there might be air underneath it so that's why you should pump it and twist it and pump it and twist it and do that as, as often as you can um you don't need to go too obs uh, obsessively with it um but it doesn't hurt to do it the, you know the more you pump it the more you twist it and the longer you leave it the smoother your dampers will be so the better you'll end up with a um when you're on track but using your thumb speeds it up dramatically like i say i can do dampers in about 10 minutes now um but if i wasn't using my thumb and i didn't want to use a shock pump i would be taking 12 hours and just leaving them to rest for most of that um, because it does have a significant benefit to the to the uh, control on the chassis and it does 
ultimately have a, a benefit to your enjoyment of the hobby when your dampers work well and your car drives well the car is more fun and you enjoy yourself more definitely i think that's a that's a good moment to wrap it up um yeah. as, as said if there's any more detailed things you want to learn about dampers maybe the springs or like damper geometry something like that yeah. um just uh, send a question and we can uh, maybe go over it in another episode yeah for sure um, and, and i do intend to um at some point when i've when i'm not working from home i do intend to do some videos on uh uh how to build dampers uh at a more advanced level um we'll probably do a another live stream with some better tips i think um for more advanced drivers um but it's like i said before we we wanted to make sure that we cover the basics because a lot of people don't know this and you know a lot of people that have been in the hobby quite a while don't know some of this stuff and i think it gets when you've been in in the hobby for a while it gets a bit uh difficult to ask the basic questions for some people <laughs> so it's always worth covering it and uh, so everyone's on the same page but uh yeah, if you've got any specific topics you want us to cover um at the moment we're doing a lot of basic uh beginner things because we've got a lot of new guys that are watching these streams so we're trying to cater for those as well as the more advanced guys but if there's something you specifically want us to discuss um it can be anything it can be technical things like this it can be uh stuff like the judging discussions we've had before um you can either leave a comment in chat or in the comments below if you're watching this after it was live uh fire me a message at the rc uh drift pace facebook page um, and we'll see if we can cover it. Uh, you know, it might not be something that happens straight away. Um, we've got a, quite a few topics planned that we're, uh, that need a bit more thought put into how we can cover it. You know, being able to show small things like dampers is quite tricky. Um, we need to get second cameras set up and stuff like that, which we can do. Um, we've just got to work out the technicalities of it. Um, but if it's something people really want, we'll, we'll push that further forward, I think, and, and make it happen sooner. Exactly. And maybe with this also, uh, the past couple of weeks, we've been, you guys have been building on body shells. You're going to have to start so, that again, uh, Taj, the past couple of weeks. Ah. <laughs> We've been showing some progress on uh, what everyone's been building with yes. uh, their new body shells uh, since uh, not many people are driving right now. Um, so if you have anything like that, also uh, feel free to send it in. Yeah, um, and I uh, I promise I'll be working on some projects soon, but I've just got to get this thing fixed. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, the in the meantime, I'll finish my crown and uh, take you guys through that. Yes, for well. sure. Yeah, and uh, and also, have you got any specific questions for Taj about his crown, um, or if there's anything you want to see uh, more information on? Uh, again, leave comments, uh, far as a message, whatever. We can take care of that and make sure you get the info you want. But uh, I'll do for this week. So we'll see you next week. Yes. Uh, hopefully, we won't have any more interruptions, and hopefully, the stream held up okay. I've had some internet connection problems for the last day or two, so fingers crossed it didn't cut out for anyone. But um, yeah, we'll be back next week with hopefully uh, another topic for you guys. Yes, thanks for watching. See you yeah. later. Bye for now.